Welcome back to the CMAS podcast, everybody. Today, we are going to be revealing the one secret the opposition does not want you to know. The one superior self-help protocol to beat all self-help protocols. It's the one holy Catholic apostolic church. Thank you for tuning into CMASK. We will see you guys next Friday. Um, so, <laughs> but uh, so okay, I've been not gonna explicate it. <laughs> nope, that's it. Uh, become Catholic, become Sorry. Catholic, or you'll be sad and fat and gay and lame. <laughs> um, no, so I, I've been um, considering something recently. I, I actually just sent Tim a screenshot of this text that I found um, from August 14th, 2022 at 9.25 a.m. I sent him a text. Does the Catholic Church hold the fullness of all truth? And at 6.41 p.m., in true Gordonian fashion, he replies, yes, it does. And that What's was... charisma? <laughs> I was referring to the time delay as Gordonian. <laughs> oh, oh, I was like, I thought I was going to say it in a fashionable way, and I was like, yes, Bye. it does. <laughs> um, and that was before I had reverted and was just sort of stress testing a few different aspects of the Catholic Church. One of them that I, I discussed with Tim, I think on his channel, was uh, the effeminism that is rampant within the church and sort of my perception of Christianity as being effeminate. But the other one that I had that I just couldn't wrap my mind around after being an atheist for so many years was like, okay, well, you're telling me that every answer to every important question is contained within this religion. That seems absurd because what I've done for years and what I'm sure many people do is especially men we live in a way where we leverage our intellect we do research we come to conclusions we develop habits and perspectives and then also you're catholic like on the side like that's like the sports team that you associate with what'd you say tim you're muted i didn't say anything oh. ah um and so i think that's pretty backward and uh, i started tossing the question around in my head, what if I treated the Catholic Church the way that I've treated all of these self-help protocols that as a young man I I explored? And just as some examples, I was trying to think through and prep for the show, what are like the books that I had read over the years? This is just a small sample. This is not comprehensive, but books, self-help books that I picked up in my late teens, early 20s. The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. Waking Up by Sam Harris, Brain Lock by Jeffrey Schwartz, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck by Mark Manson, 12 Rules for Life by Peterson, 4-Hour Workweek and 4-Hour Body by Tim Ferriss, This Is How by Augustine Burroughs, The Rational Male by Roel Tomasi, unfortunately, I read that. And so uh, the proposition that I wanted to discuss with you guys today was that if a man were to apply himself at practicing the faith and studying its contents and premises as much as most people try to pursue protocols, self-help, morning routines, journaling, nutritional regimens, listening to podcasts, uh, that they would actually get what they're trying to get, which is eudaimonia, it's this feeling of well-being. Um, so to start, Mike, I actually wanted to pitch it to you. Um, I wanted to ask you guys, what are uh, practices or teachers that you found compelling prior to really deepening your practice of the faith that then you realize Catholicism actually solved better? And Mike, I'm pitching to you first because you, you've talked about this um, quite a bit on your YouTube channel recently with the rosary and alcoholism and so on yeah so i found so, so there was a bunch of things already before my reversion that i think i was doing well but what they were aligned to i think was the wrong reason it, mm -hmm. it was more of a vain narcissistic pursuit so the closest relationship i have with this or the deeper the deepest relationship i have with this is through training um it had been a vehicle of, of vanity for me so there was something that was good in practice but what it was aligned to um was disordered because it put me at the top instead of putting the uh, what what it actually is is that it's it's suffering 
And it's willful suffering that produces a, a meaningful result. And so the way that I I align it now is, you know, <laughs> of course, you know, you can't compare a, a heavy deadlift the way that, you know, Christ suffered, but there is some kind of a parallel there with the training of the body, the subduing of the body. Um, uh, that is a willful suffering that I think is very, um, I mean, it's, it's part and parcel of our walk as Catholics is the understanding of suffering and the sanctification of redemptive suffering, not vain suffering is what we talked about uh, in the last episode. Um, and then nutritional practice, you know, I lost over a hundred pounds. And so what is that? That's the virtue of temperance, right? It's the virtue of restraint, but it was aligned for a vain purpose. So it was a vain goal and I never really found much, I guess, peace or solace in it because it was always like the, I'm chasing the, the imaginary carrot on the stick type of thing. Um, and and now that these things are aligned with a with, with a higher purpose, I see how these things by themselves and of themselves, when disordered, um, become objects of maybe the word is maybe not the right word is idolatry, um, but of almost of self worship. You're you're giving it up to yourself instead of pinning it to the cross. And um, it, now that I have the awareness that I do. You know, when I go to the gym and, and let's say I don't hit a lift, for example, like, you know, my last day before I actually closed my gym two weeks ago after eight years of owning it, or yeah, two weeks ago, I, I missed 805 in front of my family. And that was quite demoralizing um, for about five seconds because my worth is not on that on the either end of that bar where if it was two, two years ago, I would have lost it. I would have been despondent. Mm. God didn't will it to happen that day. Thank you, Lord, for this example. You know, this happened for me, not to me. There's a redemptive suffering in that, even though I, I felt like I humiliated myself in front of my family. Uh, and praise the Lord for that peace that comes with it. So ho hopefully that, you know, somewhat answers what you were saying there, Nick. Those yeah, are the, part, the two greatest wanna, examples to me. Did you, I, oh, uh, just people, everybody should go subscribe to Mike's YouTube channel as well. He's putting out really good content there. Uh, sort of Thank you. long form solo podcast videos like 18 to 25 minutes i've been really enjoying them it's almost like kind of Thank like you. a standalone sea mask thing but um yeah i i was hoping you would also just for those who haven't seen that yet if you want to touch on um the the rosary and your journey with alcohol and what you explain there just if you want to summarize that quick because it's kind of what i'm talking about where you know you have the 12-step program and you might have all these self-help books or whatever but what really um found its way all the way to your core was the Catholic faith. And that was more transformative. Yeah. So there was a couple pieces to that. Um, and that was giving it up in a sort of penitential offering to the Lord. But that realization only came through the practice of the rosary where I realized that. So all these guys with these self-help books, all these self-help gurus, they're, they're relying very much on their own strength. And a lot of them are quite strong. But I realized with this particular issue with alcohol, I didn't have that kind of endurance. I didn't have that kind of strength. I was at the mercy of it. I didn't have control of it. It was it was disordered. It was to the point where I think it was honestly um, like diabolical obsession. I can't tell you how much I would think about drinking when I wasn't, and 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 it would it would actively hate how much it how how it felt when I was doing it. And I tried to quit so many times, but it was upon that first rosary, and then coming to this conclusion right after. Oh yeah. I remember when my great grandmother used to not eat meat on Fridays and I looked into that. Oh yeah. Fridays are a day of pain. Okay, great. I now want to give this up on Friday because if I can break this longstanding habit of drinking on Fridays and how it's like coupled with this deadlift ritual and everything that I can give it up for good. And that's what happened. It, it, it wasn't my own strength. There's another kind of cool example of this too. The last Sunday I was exhausted. Okay. Like completely exhausted i dude i'm not joking i probably had like 500 milligrams of caffeine did nothing just this fog lead boots level exhaustion and i remember driving on the way back from church and praying the rosary i said okay i don't want to pray it right now but i'm gonna pray it and no joke just like how i all of a sudden had this strength that was from above not within that allowed me to quit alcohol this fog just poof disappeared mike is a quick aside disappeared with the was your tiredness on account of because of the 500 milligrams of caffeine a heart attack? Just a quick question. <laughs> I I, uh, I don't I don't think so because I felt instantly better after that. But there was a period of I in the morning was. where I didn't have, I didn't have any. Yeah, that yeah, that's right. In a roundabout way. Sorry. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was a period of time I I I, I didn't I hadn't consumed any stimulants in the morning, and it was the same level of, of exhaustion. 
prayed the rosary and then poof gone. So yeah. I'm not sure exactly how that relates to, you know, what we're talking about here, but there's something uh, certainly interesting there. I don't want to sound like I'm trying to be Taylor Marshall 2.0, pray the rosary or you're not on the team type of deal. But, you know, if I can encourage one, some, one person that hasn't ever done it uh, to do it, um, you should def definitely do it. So, yeah. As former well, TNT are... viewers know, I am Taylor Marshall 2.0. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So that's, that's, that's kind of what I was trying to get at there is that there's um, a total misperception of the church as like this dusty thing that like your great grandmothers did. And it doesn't effectuate change in your life oh. now to today. And I mean, it's just like a very ubiquitous assumption. Um, but Tim or Will, can I just say something uh, real quick? Yeah, yeah. Put my Catholic practice first before everything. Everything beneath it now is well ordered. I don't worry about money. I don't stress over what I don't have or what I want. There is complete peace over every outcome. Uh, don't care whether I miss or lift or sort of how, how I look in the. You know, if my abs appear one day versus the other, this would really used to get to me, guys. And it might sound stupid. There's like this profound peace knowing that like I'm not fully in control. All I have to do is be obedient and trust in his will, not my own. And, you know, I I remember we drove we drove down probably the most prestigious neighborhood in our city here. And, you know, it, I'm like, oh, you know, it'd be awesome to live here. And it's something that I love. And, and I home that night and i said lord don't give me an appetite beyond my means or don't give me an appetite that gets in the way of my walk with you and all of a sudden those thoughts that anxiety that started to stir up because i of this me coveting this thing or this area disappeared mm -hmm. praise the lord if you're putting out these practice for the, 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 the these practices first i don't know everything beneath it just kind of puts it, it gets neatly put on the shelf but easier said than done yeah, first things first, second things second, as C.S. Lewis says. And then you get both. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, Tim, I've I've never talked with you about this. I'm curious if you had any period of uh, self help. You don't seem like the type of guy who would, honestly. Like I'm very much more like the self improvement junkie. Like go out, buy the supplement, read the blog post type of thing. Did you ever have any kind of foray into that in the way that I'm referring to? No, you are correct. Because <laughs> fuck them. I, mean, like, I don't. Yeah, like what can they offer me? It's just some guy. Yeah. And when you asked about on uh, when you asked about the church, the the amended appended answer is, well, of course, it's the one true ontology. That means it carries with us with it these um, branches of knowing that are accurate. You know, epistemology, metaphysics, physics, um, the ethics to some extent, but none of them is some sort of utopian panacea. So I always knew that if, because I mean, I'm a cradle Catholic, like well, I guess three of us are, I always knew that if Roman Catholicism wasn't true, then nothing was not. Tony Tony Robbins like he's just a, a very large large man but that doesn't mean <laughs> that anything he's saying is true if so Roman Catholicism is, is not true then he's so big uh, <laughs> gosh gosh he's big but yeah if Roman Catholicism wasn't true which I didn't believe in until I was late 20s fully at about 29 then nothing could be true but it is an ontology and it does bear with it some of that tragic greek worldview amor fati insofar as it enjoins us to embrace our cross so self-improvement is all about kind of judeo-buddhism avoiding suffering and your teeth sparkle when you talk and and um stuff for for the hoi polloi i always knew that i before i was catholic again i had embraced through the study of philosophy under Dr. Charles, the, the more fatigue. I was like, this appeals to me because if, if Roman Catholicism is not true, 
then nothing is aside from like try to love whatever happens to you there's nothing to improve upon there's no it's the the ontological proof of god it's anselmian that if there's no model of perfection then you're no one can aspire toward anything it's um, process philosophy nietzsche hegel heraclitus heidegger a lot of h's and once I realized, oh, what I do like no. about Amor Fati no. can be, it has been incorporated into Catholicism. And I realized Jesus really did die on a cross and it really did raise up. And it's all true, the one true myth. Then I was like, oh, it, it all works perfectly. But we should talk about the branches at some point. The branches? Yeah. I mean, for an ontology or a worldview to be true, I, I wanted Will to be able to say his piece. But for an ontology to be true, it's got to be able to cover. It's got to be able to ground itself, for, first off, metaphysically, and it can't do so without an epistemology. And, a, and a, an epistemology can't do it without a physics. And a, all of that points human beings towards anthropology, which involves, you know, what actually is a human sort of metaphysically and what actually ought a human to do ethically. None of these guys even are, are like educated enough to make a stab at having a complete grounding in all of the branches. So that was another reason I just never really had a go at it. But um, Catholicism does, and it doesn't take away your suffering. That's all I was saying, which is all self-help is about. That's another good point. Will, what, what do you got? Well, <clears throat> I wasn't raised Christian, so funnily enough, I kind of came to it from the alternative route that Tim's just described, like if not Catholicism, then some kind of stoic Nietzschean self-help basically is all you've got. And the Stoics, Nietzsche, that is just high level self-help. I haven't read any, any of those books, Nick, that you listed at the start, but they're going to be some version of dumbed down Stoicism and Nietzsche. Ultimately, that's all they reduced to. Yeah. And I found that by just, looking at what the Stoics or Nietzsche had to say and thinking, okay, and then what? Like, so let's say you're Achilles or you're Beowulf or you're one of these studs that everyone looks up to and then you die and that's it. Then what? What objective meaning, value, purpose have you really got out of any of that self-improvement? And Pascal, French scientist, philosopher, makes this same point when he just says, either the resurrection is true or no matter how good your life is, no matter how glorious the last act of the play is bloody. You're buried. The dust goes on your head and that's it. All the fine talk about echoes in eternity and gladiator and all those great pagan stories. It doesn't actually echo in eternity. Mm -hmm. And the other big lie is that you can give yourself perfection somehow. You can't because it's not yours to give. So what you actually find out from the self-help journey, if you try hard enough and pursue it for long enough, is just how limited your ability to actually help yourself is. Mm. Because you are the broken one. Like your intellect is darkened, your will is weakened. So you can actually find your way to the need for God's grace to overcome even the most basic temptations if you really do try to fight all of them yourself. Because you realize you can't. You can't even keep the natural law perfectly by yourself. So for me, having a wife and kids and trying to take family life seriously, that's when I started to realize I, even stuff that I actually care about and want to be really good at, I'm, I'm not actually very good at it by myself. Wow. Yeah, what Tim was explaining about the the underpinnings of the Catholic Church is where I I didn't know that I wanted to go. Like I, I had the sort of general premise that, okay, Catholicism does have it all. Um, but how do we get there? And the only intuition that I had about this was that <clears throat> I think what everybody's chasing with self-help is eudaimonia that they want to, they want to feel better, but it's actually not just that they want to suffer less. I think they want meaning. And at least this is, this has been my experience with it. Like they wanted to understand and they wanted their life to have meaning and purpose. And, um, the church has that and works because of Tim, what you were starting to break down. Can you continue on that of the ontology, the epistemology and anthropology and so on? 
Yeah. I was just for, for a preliminary thought self help. I, mean, I did work in a bookstore, uh, into the, the, actually the largest Barnes and Noble, I think in America in Dallas in park and Preston for a, a while in college. And we would all make fun of the self help section. I just remembered this. It's so intellectually and spiritually impoverished that it doesn't even know how to make a convincing Fugazi of a worldview. And that's marks a lot of American um, genre. A lot of the genres in a bookstore are created by um, American sort of do-gooderism. Mm -hmm. and, and I think they a lot of these categories in, in the bookstore, in the typical Barnes & Noble today, or exist even internationally in other countries. So there's there's that fact to contend with. And what I mean is they don't even know you have to cover your basis metaphysically and say, okay, what is the, the, the topic you're dealing with really? Like Heidegger, Heidegger came along in the 20th century and said that Aristotle got a lot of stuff right, but he was studying uh, beings rather than being. Heidegger would famously say, who was a metaphysician, just not a Christian, would say that um, the Western philosophical tradition studied the be accidental being rather than being qua being. Um, even though Aristotle claimed to. So you have to know what it is that you're really studying. People don't even know their topics because they're taking an accidental approach to it. I'm not a Heideggerian, but I've studied a lot of Heidegger. Um, so there's, there's a start that people don't understand that to do something, you have to define it. And to define it, you have to say what it really is. So that's metaphysics. Well, what right. is the thing? And to, to do that, you have to say, how do I know what the thing really is? Because I'm dealing with more than um, the material iteration of what it is. And that um, is a subjective account. How do I know? What are my structures of knowing? What are my grounding processes? Are they, you know, famously, to use the Kantian dichotomy, are they empirical? Or are they rationalistic? Or are they some Kantian mashup? That's the trendy thing. Or are they some hylomorphic or Aristotelian mashup? And um, then you have to go through. It's really boring, really difficult, but really important. How do I ground what I know about what I know? That's epistemology. And then you have to say, how does this square with a proper conception of anthropology? So you have to say how the intellect and the will work together, or if you're a, a dumb, like, like retard, Sam Harris, you know, you just say there is not really any such thing as the well, not really any such thing as the intellect either, but there's enough of a epiphenomenon. Yeah, epiphenomenon that we'll just say, okay, well, really intellect is is brain, but but whatever. And you move forward. Um, but the, but they don't do that. Um, and then of course, once you have established in a um uh, in anthropology, you have to say, okay, here, here's what we're we're operating from. You have to establish a, a meaningful physics. That's really a branch of philosophy, not not science. The way everyone's been brainwashed, you have to have uh, an understanding of of what the material iteration of things means for the metaphysical iteration of things. So, so you have to start with Aristotle's physics before you get to his metaphysics. And um, that's, you also, that's also where you learn a bunch of the logical axioms, the, the first principles, like principle of practical reason, principle of the excluded middle, principle of non-contradiction, um, things like that, principle of proportionate cause, um, ideas that cannot be proven, but you, you cannot make any other syllogism without. So we assume that you can prove that if someone seeks to subvert them, they will make recourse practically to the said um, first principle. Mm -hmm. It's called the uh, Aristotelian concept of retortion. It's a surrogate for a proof for things that can't be proven, logical first principles. And you get that in the physics, typically. Um, if, if you're doing a half-decent substitution for the Aristotomist model that, that, that we're just calling true, we're assuming to be true here. Like, like some stupid, um, not stupid, 
like the the Kantian version that's we're still all the rage and has been for three hundred years, or the Hegelian version, or, or you know Schleiermachian version, some something like that. And then after that, you say, okay, I take all these together, and I'm like, how then should a human being live? And and you have to come up with a reasonable conception of ethics, the least precise of all these sciences branches. <laughs> and um, the I mean within. Catholicism, it it kind of staggers me when I go read a little bit of Catholic theology. I'm surprised to know that what's become really popular, and I don't have really a position here because I'm not a theologian, is um, the material sufficiency of Scripture, which is a theological theory that basically every uh, you know, formal sufficiency of Scripture would just be, of course, sola scriptura, so that's not Catholic. But the material sufficiency of Scripture theory is that Everything is in Scripture, at least by dint of tradition. To me, it seems like a Protestant convert's cope, but um, it's popular at places like Steubenville. I don't think it's tremendously important whether you say, okay, everything that's true within within uh, Scripture and tradition is true, but but the what they bandy about is, is it really true because it's a scriptural principle that was presupposed? by uh catholic tradition or not um i i tend to think there are things that are really in tradition that aren't in scripture but i, I it doesn't really matter whether you're material sufficiency of scripture person or not you would say that between scripture and tradition and the, the and i would say the requirements of knowing the structures of knowing that's where the aristotomism comes in the, the Roman Catholic tradition really does have all the answers, but it doesn't, it's not self-help at all because self-help centers around like, get me out of pain, take away my headache, um, make, make me look uh, better or feel better about myself. And that's just, that's repudiated in the moment that the individual believer <clears throat> shuns his own life at, at the, at the fisher boats and follows Christ. I mean, like in theory, you're supposed to say like, okay, I don't, I don't care much how I look or how I feel. I like, I want the truth and the truth is Jesus. And then the Catholic tradition gives you all the other truths that you, you would find if you really wanted to, to, to ground the love for Jesus. But of course you don't. A lot of, most people take the St. John Vianney route. It's just like, it's self-evident that Jesus is the way, the truth and the light. And so I'm going to follow him. You don't have to go understand things, but the Catholic ontology that I would say really does include Aristotomism um, is for people that want to do the geometrical proof, which is not necessary to follow Jesus in the first place. You're, you're after proving things. In that sense, I answered yes, lo, those many, was it months or years ago? It's, it's years, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that you didn't um, type all of that out to me when I asked you. <laughs> I did, but then it got or my kid erased it. Uh, kid ate my homework. Classic. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you you kind of ended on one of the notes that Will said in our chat about this, which is that truth is a person, and so the Catholic Church being where you find Christ it would make sense that that's that's where you would get all of those answers truth's not a set of protocols uh, it's a it's a person with whom you have a relationship with which is kind of an, an insane concept as well it's, it's like a really hard thing to wrap your mind around as like a mechanistic atheistic 20 year old but you also I think it, sorry Mike, go, go ahead will no go, go ahead, ahead man i was just gonna say really quickly what Tim was saying there for people who don't have philosophy PhDs is basically to know what is good for a creature, in this case, a human being. You have to really understand what that creature is. There's no point talking about self help unless you know what the thing you're trying to help is, in which case, yourself. Like, how do you help a dog live well? You got to understand what dogs need. Same for a cat, same for a lizard or a snake or whatever. You know the demands of the thing, and then you can actually help it. Without uh, anthropology of man, you can't do that. And these self-help self writers don't give that to us. 
you can see though that we are all craving some kind of relationship with a person right nick because what guys do is they look up to a kind of guru figure everyone's on the lookout for some kind of yep. leader and guys like tony robbins or whoever he is i think i know who you're talking about tim said he's he's big guys think oh he looks like kind of cool like i like his face or like his jaw or he goes to the gym or something like that and that need to actually follow someone and be exist in a hierarchy it comes out think about all the pagan literature where the warrior just wants a lord to devote his life to like someone to pledge your sword to just give me that and i'll be happy mm. like i know i'm not supposed to be the alpha in charge of stuff i just want a guy that i can follow and that gives my life some meaning and structure so they might not know that they're looking for christ but they are it just comes out in other forms and then when you get that relationship when you have someone you can truly look up to and respect and want to be like that's what it's really about that's what guys want Great. Yeah. And so I think imprinted in all of us, I think so with the self-help stuff, it's like the striving toward a goal, right? So what does St. Paul talk about in Philippians 3? It's he presses toward the goal and that's the prize of the upward call of Christ Jesus. And so, but people want to circumvent Jesus or maybe they're not aware that that's what the goal is. I was always striving toward this level of strength or this level of wealth and all these things. And the higher that I achieved, the higher I climbed on that ladder, the more I realized it was it was empty and meaningless and you kind of just grow to get used to whatever space you're in, whether it's a bigger house, a nicer physique, more money in the bank account, that it was meaningless. That now, now that it comes to the fullness of the truth, I realize that the striving and the straining toward the goal is salvation. Because although we are all within the church, uh, you know, we partake in the sacraments, we're not certain of our salvation. Our Protestant brethren are going to vehemently disagree with us, the, the one saved, always saved crew. But I'm not sure. Just like, I mean, what does St. Paul imply there? He's straining toward the goal. He was never mm -hmm. certain of his salvation either. And so that's the the ultimate goal. That's the the, the most well-ordered a person can live their life is that, hey, you're not living for this bigger house because once you get there, hey, bro, you're going to feel exactly the same. That nicer car, that, that, that beautiful woman, whatever. Realize that the ultimate goal to strive toward is salvation, is that. Uh, relationship with Christ is that uh, devotion to faith. And I've experienced that myself and a guy that put his meaning behind things that were fleeting. So all of these self-help books kind of just um, scratch that itch. And then some of the people, which is a very small percentage of those people that reach the other side of what those big books teach and preach, realize it's all meaningless. So what happens? The goalposts shift. But when you're striving and you're straining toward the goal of, of Christ and salvation, the goalposts don't really shift. It's just a continual process of sanctification. And through that, that doesn't mean there's no suffering. It just means that there's profound peace and understanding that it's it's not all within your control. And it's ultimately his will to be done. And it's his providence at play. And he's sovereign through it all. So I'll end on that note, boys. I got to jet out of here. Beautiful discussion. I look forward to uh, listening to the rest of it after. Thanks, Mike. See you, Mike. God bless you guys. See, See you. Bye, Mike. Something that has been tough for me to let go of is what a, like what a human is and is supposed to be. Um, my conception of it has been quite different because I'm I have an obsession with with biology and, and nutrition and science in that in that way, and I I have this perception of like the optimized person, and this is a, a way in which Tim is a really good counterbalance to me on this because. I'll bring up, you know, some nutrition, whatever. And he's like, that's fine. But it like kind of doesn't matter to like salvation. And like, that's cool. You can, you can feel better. Like, yeah, it's good to be, it's good to have a modicum of health or to be healthy. But like a, a human person isn't actualized by being in tip top biological shape. They're actualized by being like virtuous. And I'm, I'm coming around to the idea that I would imagine that most people would feel better in the way that they want to feel better by sinning less, receiving the sacraments and being more virtuous and not like drinking more water or meditating for 10 minutes every morning or whatever. Like, do, do you guys agree with that? Yeah. I mean, just yeah. think, think, sorry, well, I was just going to say one line, think really quick of the climatological diversity that existed which controlled all the different ancient diets, all of these silly 
you know, this is the real ancient diet and therefore the real diet humans should eat. There's so much diversity among them based on climate and mm -hmm. vegetation mm -hmm. that um, it, it still, that, that has always made me laugh. Like there's a million and that's why a lot of them have strengths and weaknesses and you can basically also live a hundred years on the Taco Bell twice a day diet um, if you have the right genes where, you know, and the, the, the life yeah. expectancy is still twice what it was in the year 1900. So even though people are, are fat and flabby and look kind of gross, if they do that, um, get, get down to really soteriology. You know, what do you need to get to heaven? And while you're here, that's largely governed by, um, faith and reason. And, and that's why I do always urge people to study the, uh, Nicomachean ethics as well. Sorry, Will. No, I was going to make a, a similar point, which is that if it's not helping you get to heaven, why are you so worried about it? It doesn't really matter yeah. about exactly what diet you're following or what your body fat is or how much you lift or whatever it is, even how much you know about philosophy. Yeah, a, li a little bit's helpful because it can help you avoid falling into really stupid intellectual errors that are going to threaten your soul. But geeking out about it too much there are probably better uses of your time in the life of St. Jerome is an, an angel uh, tells him off for spending too much time reading the pagan philosophers rather than scripture. It's like, why are you doing that? It's not as important as you think. Well, do you have any um, position on material sufficiency of scripture? I'm just, I'm a, I'm a Thomas philosopher, very, very, very different from a, even a Thomas theologian. Uh, but so do you have any kind of inkling either way? To me, it seems like a Steubenville Franciscan cope because some of the lead professors are are converts from Protestantism, but it's not a bad cope because it does, it is officially Catholic. Um, I just, do, do you have any view on that since I brought it up? As, as, as far as I'm aware, there are uh, truths in tradition that aren't in scripture. I mean, that's what my first thought about it is. But they're like materially there. I mean, that's what I say too, of course. That's yes. the philosopher in me, just a lot of times, guys, I, I people will say, Oh, Tim's a theologian. And like, no, I, I'm a I'm a Catholic philosopher. There's some crossover, but to me, that's why I called it a cope. I'm like, well, if it's there in yeah, they're saying it's there by dint of the fact that it it must have been presupposed. Um in scripture to be there. So it's kind of like, it doesn't matter, but yeah, I just take the common sense sort of philosopher's approach to it that you just laid out. Well, yeah. it's like, I don't know how, how is, I mean, I guess you could say it with like purgatory is kind of required logically, but I don't yeah. know, like the, well, do you, the Marian dogmas. So, yeah. So are, are they just saying that it's, it's all um, implied in there and scripture draws it out? Uh, tradition draws it out of scripture but then you can find lines in scripture saying that there are many other things that christ did and taught that aren't recorded in scripture so right. that's why i was thinking there are things we know from tradition that aren't in scripture because it's not enough by itself agree um last point that i wanted to cover here is the concept of intellectual submission and the humility required to know that our intellect is insufficient to um, produce well-being in us. You know, Will, you said we can't even follow the natural law on our own. But <clears throat> it's very Gnostic. It's very Luciferian. It's very tree of knowledge of good and evil to think that if you simply leverage your intellect long enough that you can then produce well-being in yourself. And there's a um, quote I'm looking at here from St. John of the Cross, allow thyself to be taught, allow thyself to be commanded, allow thyself to be enslaved and brought into submission and despised, and thou shalt be perfect. Well, that, like perfection is downstream of that. We'll go ahead. That goes to the heart of what faith is, which most guys don't actually have a clue about. I know I certainly didn't have a clue in my early 20s about what faith is because protestantism is how most people think of faith before they learn about catholic tradition and 
the starting point for that is that you can't prove the existence of God with certainty by natural reason alone. It's something where you shut your eyes really hard and then you kind of wait for the right feelings to come along when you're reading scripture or holding hands with your buddies. And that's what faith is. It's mushy. Whereas the church says that you can establish the existence of God through natural reason alone. You're not going to know the mysteries. Even the angels can't comprehend the Trinity, for example, in its fullness. You, if you to do that, you have to be God. That's that's it. Uh, if if you could understand those mysteries fully, you would be God. So faith has got this rational component to it, and then you understand that it's taking things on God's authority, and that's fully rational to do. You can establish God's existence. You know that He can't be deceived, and that He can't deceive you. And the faith bit is actually trusting him, taking things on his authority. And that's the bit that was missing for me. Once you know that, that's why you turn to the church for all the instruction in faith and morals, because it's rock solid. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's more it's a condemned heresy in Catholicism to contradict the view that God is knowable through reason and alone. His thatness is knowable through reason alone. His, right. his whatness, of course, is not like his his quiddity is not but his thatness um i think i think it's leo the 13th condemn or maybe it's Pius nine i i forget some late 19th century pope condemns the view yep um which contradicts that god can be known through reason alone his his thatness not fideism as fideism people look it fideism. up yep yep condemned fideism. so there's this point that your your intellect is there as like what Aquinas would call a, um, you know, a, a preamble to faith. There's plenty we can clear the ground for. God exists. We have immaterial souls. You can prove that using intellectual arguments about our capacity to form abstractions, etc. So we can know all of that, prove it. And once you've got that groundwork done, then the rest of it falls into place. And there's plenty of stuff you can't figure out through natural reason alone. It's called a mystery, not because it's irrational, but because it's too deep too rich for us to fully grasp with our finite limited intellects yeah su yeah. supra rational right <clears throat> yeah well uh i think oh, we can leave it there on the idea of uh, intellectual submission just that you can't give what you don't have what you always say well and i think that's a christianity is a stalwart repudiation of self-help um, yeah, through and through. To and, what and you said about Nick, if, if if you deny one little bit of what the church teaches, like Aquinas says, you deny the whole thing. So just mm. like one mortal sin destroys charity, if you just pick and choose which bits of church teaching you like the sound of, and say, oh, okay, I'm fine with that, but uh, the, the the teaching on on Mary, no way. Mm -hmm. that, then you just destroyed the whole thing because you're mm -hmm. not given the submission of your intellect to the teaching authority. That's what the key thing is. Faith consists in that. Well, it's another mark of an ontology, the, the one true one, is that all of all of the elemental pieces are elemental. And, and um, this is what's so impoverished about Protestantism. It uh, will, will express all this so well. That they just pulled out random linchpins <clears throat> they being Luther, Calvin, Melanchthon, and uh, Zwingli, the, the four big reformers or whatever, they just pulled out random linchpins in, that hold the hull of the ship together because they didn't look like they were linchpins. Some linchpins are more obvious, even to a non-architectural mind, like, oh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to mess with that. That's load bearing. But they pulled out linchpins. The perfect example is what you just mentioned, William. It's uh, it's it's Mariology. If if Mary is not the mother of God, the way a lot of the second generation Protestants started saying, and third generation Protestants popularized, then um, then you have Apollinarianism, a, a and you divide Christ's um, hypostatic union. Right? If if Mary's the mother of Jesus but not of God, then all of a sudden. Um, Jesus uh, isn't one guy with two natures. And so you have Apollinarianism. They don't mean to do that. They would never 
Protestants knew whatever the council that is, like Cal Chalcedon or um, Constantinople, I forget. But they knew they they're down with the first four, five, six, seven councils of the church. The pro the first Protestants knew that, and they're like, no, 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 don't run foul of these first seven councils. We don't want to be, you know, a, a modern um, violator of any of these uh, least ways. Um, <clears throat> we we're down with Nicaea. We're down with Chalcedon. So. I lost, I lost the name of Arius. We don't want to be a modern day Arius. We also don't want to be a, a modern day, uh, 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 Paulin Arius or whatever his name is. So, um, they're like, yeah, that's a linchpin. Jesus is one guy with two fully God, fully man. But, but Hey, let, let's, you know, Mary being the mother of God and man, that sounds like something we can pull. We can pull that linchpin, not knowing <laughs> that, that Christology and Mariology are intimately linked. And that's, and because the true church, Catholicism, was divinely inspired, and because the true church sprang up in fertile ground with appropriate men to the measure, um, they were they were given, whether it was infused or it was just sort of natural Holy Spirit, um, genius to understand it in the next generations, even after the last apostle died and, and public revelation ended. We we're given geniuses like Jerome and Augustine and Dionysius and et al. Who could extrapolate in ways that didn't make geometrical errors? But mm -hmm. that, and the, you know, we, we got a resurgence of that in the high middle ages with, with you know, Anselm and Albert the Great and, and Thomas. But we didn't get a resurgence of that in um, um, Northwest Europe in the 16th 17th centuries those guys were, were making mistakes not knowing you know what, what was a linchpin and what wasn't yeah and once you go in another direction from what the church is teaching then the devil's going to get you in the end because mm -hmm. he's already got you anyway and that's why you end up with my probably my favorite protestants the unitarians who just deny christ divinity altogether they're Holy adorable Spirit Holy Spirit taught them that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When truth is understood to be a person, it follows naturally that the only way that you can truly love Christ in his fullness is to be a Catholic because everything else is to say, well, I, I, I like Jesus. I'm just, I don't like his hair color. Like I think Jesus is, has this hair color and I'm going to change that and tell it like you're refusing aspects of who the person is saying, I'm going to love you, but I'm not going to love that part of you. It's like, well, the, the person of Christ is truth and truth does not internally contradict. And the only place in which there's all of that is the Catholic church. And so if you really love Christ as Protestants claim to, you'd be a Catholic yeah, and what's what's funny is he says, "If you love me, keep my commandments as well." And he he instituted seven sacraments. Uh, you can't, yeah, but they're love not soteriological. Him. They're not <laughs> salvation dependent. It's like, why the if then statement? <laughs> you know, if you love me, keep, well, you think you're going to be able to love him like not in heaven? It's well, not going to work out. This this is why um, um, Aquinas says that the the love of God is actually more important than the knowledge of mm. him. Like the devil knows plenty about God, mm. but the, it's the love of him that's most important. And a little kid who just goes to church and then believes everything that she's taught and lives in accordance with the teachings, that's far more important than being some super smart Protestant theologian who rejects the authority of the church. You know more and you also love more. So I think that's really important. One thought I had as well, Nick, just coming back to something you said earlier about why guys are looking for leaders and we have gurus in the first place. So often it's based on how much money the man might earn or what he looks like or what he lifts in the gym. And I actually think it's really important for people to recognize that your priest might not even go to the gym. Um, maybe he's fat, but it's important for you spiritually to actually accept his authority anyway, and he can still save your soul. 
So I can think of a lot of guys who um, I'm one of them actually need it for their spiritual benefit to um, have a priest who does not look like an Instagram influencer with his top off in a Bugatti talking about how much money he earns and how many people respect him. Imagine if that is what it was based on, that you go to the church and you have a quick look at the guy who's the priest and you think, how, how tall are you? What does your physiognomy <laughs> look like? What do you what do you drive? Uh, what do you lift? That's not the way it's done. Becoming like a child is actually about saying, I accept the authority that you've been given by Christ. And then I understand that I'm in submission to that, which is why the first pope is a model of human frailty in some ways. A, a Protestant said, how, how can you believe this? It's ridiculous. The first pope showed he was just a fallible man. He was weak and he denied Christ. Exactly. That's the point. That's that's what it's built on. It's not on a guy. Protestant who asked that, have you ever heard of the famous historical pope named Francis I? <laughs> That makes me very glad that Peter was a little bit fallible because um, um, Pope Francis, the merciful, is ever so fallible. And if Peter had been, I don't know, even Paul, post-conversion Paul, who was probably a closer model of Christian perfection in terms of um, prelature, that would have been more intimidating. But Jesus picked Peter. It's so important to my faith in the era of francis it's been so so critical well oh no 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 this is not an accident jesus picked peter and he picked him right around the time he told him he was going to deny him three times and after he'd already goofed up lots so oh man it's not something that like came to pass where at one of the councils even like the council of jerusalem which is non-ecumenical not not one of the ecumenical councils of the church, but it took place like whatever, 54 AD, uh, 20 years after Jesus went up to heaven. That would have been really bothersome if, if Peter was elected first pope at the Council of Jerusalem, because then you'd get Protestants going, look at this gap. It's not direct lineage. The provenance is off. And the Catholics kind of just forgot how flawed Peter was. Jesus would be the one you'd have to be accusing of forgetting who Peter was. And he did it. He, he obviously he's Jesus. We don't have arguments with the Protestants about that, at least. So it's so, oh my gosh, it helps me so much in, in an era when we've, we've had now lots of Borgia popes and, um, and the, the, the famous model of, of guys that were bad in their private life. It helps me even in the era of Francis the first, when, um, it's not just private misbehaviors. It, it's, it's evident that he was put there by reformist, the Jacobinites in the cardinalate and that he's, he's really doing their work. Okay. Well, this is allowed too. And it all follows from the fact that, that that first Pope was not Paul. It was Peter. Yeah. And what, uh, what is more damnable spending three years with the person of Jesus, knowing that he being the one to say you are the son of God, knowing his divinity in person, being told you're going to deny him and then denying him three times in one night when he's at his lowest or anything that any Pope who's actually never met the person of Christ has ever done. Right. Or Paul, or, or for that matter, um, didn't, you know, helping to kill Christians being there at the martyrdom of St. Stephen, the first Christian martyr when he was just like, Hey, I, I just believed in, Pharisaism before, but he didn't actually meet Jesus in the flesh. It's that's a very stark point, Nick, Nicholas. Yeah. What a display of power as well to say, now watch this. I'm going to build a church on this guy mm -hmm. and it's yes. still mm -hmm. going to endure. You still can't shake it. Yeah. Yeah. Like imagine if Pope Francis today was at some ecumenical Abu Dhabi church of the three faiths meeting and they're like planting a tree or something and like three different reporters went up and said like are you are you with that jesus are you the head of the jesus church and he was like <clears throat> uh, uh no comment and he did that three times <laughs> like that's how bad we're talking 
We've nearly had that, by the way. <laughs> it's kind of covered full circle. Instances where I'm, we're not going to go into the Eugenio Scalfari interviews. There are like 10 or 11 of them, and he said things that are arguably worse, but um, it actually probably definitively worse to Scalfari. But, but yeah, good thought experiment. Yeah. All right, gentlemen. It's been a great episode. See you all next Friday. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to Rules for Retrogrades. So subscribe to Mike Pantile's YouTube channel. Subscribe to Will Nolan's YouTube channel. Don't follow me on Twitter unless you want to hear about uh, random nutritional things. I will have nothing good to offer you other than that. And we'll see you guys next week. Wait, Thank you so wait much. can we call out some um, projects? Because, you know, now that we're getting a su sufficiently diverse um, following, I I'd like to tell people what, what we're all working on. Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, we've got a lot of stuff in the works. Go for it, Tim. Yeah, so so Steph and I are racing through a book. We're on like chapter four, um, uh, racing through a book uh, about halfway through called Leave and Cleave. And it's nine Catholic um, marriage prep secrets that were once taught and are now censored. And um, we're doing a class on the same so it'll kind of be like a class textbook that you don't have to take the class. That class launches September the 11th, but you can you can pre-order it now and just basically take this class, save your marriage. Read this book, save your marriage. I know I know um, Mike and Will are doing similar things, but this is for the couple to join together. It's not just the, the man-only angle. So um, if you go to timothyjgordon.com, and click enroll, the class is 175 bucks, and it's it's it starts September 11th. Register today, and the class will uh, the book will be on pre order in probably two weeks. I'll refrain from making a nine eleven joke. Um, yeah. Will, what do you got going on? You can get articles on lots of different topics related to marriage, masculinity, morality on my Substack. And if you need one to one detailed help fixing problems in your marriage, step-by-step -step guidance, then I do coaching for that as well, including big stuff like guys who've been served divorce papers and turning that around because that's what I want to do with the rest of my life, fixing feminism in families, one family at a time, taking it down. So there's that if you need it. Otherwise, Substack is the place to go. Excellent. And if you're looking for marriage within the next 12 months and you are Catholic, and not an insane person, please go to www.retvrn.us and apply. And Tim and Will are going to find you a husband and or wife. We have uh, a marriage, Just or. many engagements. Just or. Not and or. Oh, yes. Husband if we're ad addressing individuals, or. it's not and or. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then in terms of projects, uh, I won't say who I'm going to interview, but I'm leaving tomorrow morning to go interview somebody that every person who watches this podcast, I'm sure knows, uh, at least by name, if not has watched their content. Very exciting. This is for the documentary, What a Woman Is. I just came back from England, where I interviewed Mr. Will Noland, had a phenomenal interview. And uh, this should be almost the penultimate we've got two interviews left um one here in town and one is mr mike pantile heading out to calgary alberta canada a to interview mike for the film as well so we've got tons of stuff going on make sure you follow everybody on every platform to stay up to date with all of them and god bless you all we'll see you next week take care god bless you too god bless you